If this is your first time at RUF, we're really glad to have you. Thanks for coming. My name is John Trapp. I'm the campus minister here. And um, RUF is, it's a place um, for people who aren't perfect, who don't have it together. Because what we really believe at RUF is that um, the gospel is, the, what the news that the Bible is telling is this, that you are far worse off than you think that you are, but in Christ, you are far more loved than you ever dared imagine. And so, we can come here and be real about, like, what is going on in our lives? Who are we really? And who is Jesus And I want you to see that in this passage. I want you to see, we've been talking about this reality that God is at work even when it feels like he's not. And um, last week we talked about what is the fruit of God's work in our lives and that his ultimate goal in your life is to bring joy. And we looked at Jesus' first miracle, remember that he turns water into wine. Of all the things he could have chosen, that's what he does first. But also we've talked about how That God is at work in the midst of our suffering. When it feels like he he couldn't be farther from at work in our lives. That he is actually in the midst of that working. And not only is he working in our own suffering, but he works through his own suffering on the cross for you. So that one day your suffering would end if you believe in him. So tonight, this is what I want you to... to, This is our last... um, talk in this series. Next week we're going to start a new series on dating and relationships, and it'll be fun. Um, maybe none of y'all will come. I don't know. If, is that scary to you? Is anyone going to come to that? I hope so. Um, but we're going to wrap up, and I want you to think about this when it comes to God's work. What does it look like for you to participate in his work? What does it look like for you to be part of the work that he's doing? Um, and I want you to see that specifically in the life of Peter. That's who we're going to look at tonight. To frame that, I want to tell you a story. Some of you have maybe heard this one before, but when I was a kid, I went over to my friend Jack's house. We were going to have a slumber party, you know. Do I still do that? That's that's a thing, right? Slumber parties? Yeah. Um, So, I guess like every night at Harden House is a slumber party, pretty much, right? Um, So, uh, I went over to Jack's house, and we were uh, watching a movie. His parents were like out on a date, and they had let us make a fire in their fireplace. We were really, you know, fourth grade boys. We were like pumped up about this fire. And so um, the movie's kind of getting towards the end, but we notice the fire is going out, which you know, we can obviously fix that problem because we love, we're fourth grade boys. We love fire. And so Jack goes out to their wood pile in his backyard, and he finds the biggest log he can find. And he like carries it in like this. I mean, it's huge. And I foolishly go over and remove the screen from the fireplace. And Jack kind of like walks over and just one, two, three, like oof, throws this massive dry log on this pile of burning hot coals. And the fire just, it's like an explosion happened in their living room. It's just poof, and all of these hot coals fly out of the fireplace onto Mrs. Smith's beautiful white carpet. And the coals just start to do this, like burning deep down into the carpet. Y'all, I lost my mind. I freaked out. I would love to tell you that like in the midst of that, I was super clutch and like knew exactly what to do. I was not. I... <laughs> I'm like panicking and see, and I don't know how, what to do to like clean this up. I run into their kitchen and grab paper towels and like wrap them around my hand and like run back and pick up a burning hot coal with a paper towel, which immediately burns through the paper towel and burns my hand and like starts screaming in pain and writhing in pain from this burned hand that I now have. And Jack like luckily was more level-headed and clutch and has his dad's leather gloves on. He's just like picking up and like, pssst, like you know, just throwing him back into the fire. But the Smiths came home and we had to show them what we had done, and it was awful. But this is, the, this is the, the image that I want you to have in your head, is John Trapp, little John Trapp, running around trying to make everything better and being completely unable to. 
with my measly little paper towels, thinking that I can clean this up and make this okay. Because that's the disciples all the time in the Bible. They always take matters into their own hands. And it always leads to their failure. And look, I don't say that to like throw stones at them and be like, man, those disciples are idiots. Because you know what? That's exactly what I'm like. And that's exactly what I think all of us are like. Let me give you an example of that. About how the disciples, when they freak out and take matters into their own hands, they, they fail. There's this, it's, it's pretty comical the way that um, the Bible frames this. In the book of Mark, you've got um, Jesus, he feeds 5,000 people bread and fish. With just, it's a miraculous feeding because they only have two pieces of, they only have two fish, they have five pieces of bread, and he just begins breaking them, and more and more, there's more and more, and they, he feeds 5,000 people with that small amount of food, okay? So that happens early on in the book of Mark. Then in Mark chapter 8, he does th- a similar miracle. This time he feeds 4,000 people fish and bread. Look, look, the next thing that happens after Jesus feeds the 4,000 people fish and bread, the disciples get on a boat. They get on a boat, and Mark 8 says, they began discussing that they only had one piece of bread. They're like on the boat. Jesus has just, they've seen Jesus feed 9,000 people miraculously with fish, like a little bit of fish, a little bit of bread. And now they're on the boat, and they're on like a long trip, and they're like, uh, whoops, we forgot to pack lunch. Only one of us brought one piece of bread. What are we going to do? And Jesus, he, he like stops. He's like, guys, do y'all remember when I fed 5,000 people fish and bread? They're like, yeah. He's like, how many baskets of leftovers did we have from those five pieces of bread and two fish? They're like, 12 baskets full of leftovers. He's like, that's right. And when I fed 4,000 people, how many leftovers did we have then? They're like, seven baskets full of leftovers. He's like, that's right. And then he goes, do you not yet understand? It's like, if I was Jesus, I would have been like, okay, you know what? You guys are fired. I'm going to go find some more disciples. Like, this is ridiculous. You have seen me do this miracle two times, and now we're on the boat, and you're worried? Do you not understand that you're with me? You're okay? But what the disciples do is they panic, they forget, they fail. And this is what I want you to see. I want you to see first Peter's failure, second Jesus' response, and third Jesus' call to Peter. Okay, Peter's failure, Jesus' response, er, and Jesus' call. Okay, so to appreciate this passage that Grace just read, I want you to think about this. Because this is the setting for Peter. Where is the place in your life that you have most failed God? I want each one of you to think about that. Or maybe if you're not a Christian, where is the place in your life where you've just most failed? Where you would be most ashamed for someone to know about you? Or where you've done like the worst thing? Because that's the setting for Peter in this passage. That is the setting. Let me explain what I mean by that. And to get to that, I have to give you a little bit of background information. Okay, so the night before Jesus is going to be crucified, his disciples are meeting together in this upper room, and Jesus looks at them, he's like, you guys are all going to fall away. Listen to what he says. This is from Mark 14. He says, you'll all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, I love this. He's like, he goes, even though they'll all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. You you guys said, they all said, we'll never leave you. We'll never deny you. And Peter, most emphatically, I'll die with you if I have to. Y'all, 19 verses later, 19 verses in, in Mark chapter 14. Mark 14, verse 50 comes along. Jesus is arrested. All the people come, they arrest him, and the disciples, listen to what they do. Mark 14, 50. 
they all lessen and spread. Every single disciple runs out on him. They leave him. In the face of fear, they panic. They take matters into their own hands, and they leave Jesus and fail him. And the biggest failure of all is Peter. Now, there's something really beautiful that that John is, is doing in this text in John 21 that Grace read. The location of this appearance that Jesus has is where he fed 5,000 people fish and bread. It's a place called Tabgah. You can go to it in Israel. There's two things that happened in Tabgah. Jesus fed 5,000 people fish and bread, and Jesus appeared to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee, which we just read about. And he appears to Peter, and it's the place of Peter's shame. And this, let me tell you why, what I mean by that. So Peter's like, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And Jesus is like, Dude, you're going to do it before the end of the night. And John makes this note that Peter goes, and he goes outside the courtyard where they are trying Jesus, where they're giving him this, like, mockery of a trial that's going to lead to his crucifixion. And John makes this note, and he says, now Peter was sitting beside a charcoal fire. And these characters start walking up to him, and they're like, aren't you one of the disciples? And he's like, no, I'm not. And then this little slave girl, like literally the, the least threatening person in that culture, a slave girl, completely powerless. She comes up to him and she's like, no, I think that you're one of his disciples. And he says, no, I'm not, because he's afraid of her. And then the last person comes up, they're like, I recognize your accent. You're from Galilee. And it says, Peter rained down curses. Now listen, Richard Bauckham, who's a... Um, a commentator, he says, there's only one person that Peter could have been cursing to convince them that he wasn't a disciple. He wasn't cursing them. He wasn't even cursing himself. He was cursing Jesus. I'll prove to you I'm not a disciple. And he rains down curses on Jesus. That's what Peter does. He's that much of a coward. He's that much of a failure. And this is what I want you to see. I want you to see what Jesus does with him. Jesus' response. Do you know what Jesus does with failure? He goes to the cross for Peter. When his disciples had run away, when he was so afraid that he's in the garden and he's crying out, And he asked him, will you just please like stay awake with me and pray with me? He's so afraid. And as soon as he's taken away, they leave. And Peter curses his name and Jesus dies for him. And not only that, this is so beautiful. When the angels appear to the women in Mark 16, when they go to the grave and they see that the grave is empty and that he's risen Do you know what they say to her? Listen to this. They say, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? Now listen to this. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee, the place where they're about to meet him in Galilee, at Tabgah. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you. There you will see him just as he told you. Do you know why that's so good? It's because Jesus, tell, he, he, he's like, angels, you make sure that when they come, they find out. You make sure that Peter's still invited because he's the biggest failure. He's not going to think that he's still welcome. But the angels say, make sure you tell Peter that Jesus still wants to see him. That coward who cursed his name. Jesus is for him. And this is where it just gets beautiful. Because they go to Tabka. They go to the place where Jesus fed 5,000 people fish and bread miraculously. And they get there, 
And Peter sees Jesus, and did you catch when Grace was reading it, that like, he kind of loses his mind? Like, everyone's in the boat, and John is like, I think that's Jesus on the shore. And P- it says Peter put on his clothes and jumped into the water and started swimming. And, like, the rest of the disciples just, like, paddle up in the boat, right? They're like, like normal people. And Peter gets out dripping wet, and he walks up to Jesus, and you know what Jesus is sitting beside? Did you see it? He's sitting by a charcoal fire. Now, y'all, there's only two times in the entire Bible that the Greek word for charcoal fire is used. Two times. The first time, when Peter's outside the courtyard cursing Jesus' name, saying, I don't know that man. That's the first time. The place of Peter's greatest failure and shame. And Peter walks up dripping wet onto that shore, and the person sitting there is Jesus, and he's sitting by the place of Peter's greatest failure. And he's making breakfast on it. And the meal hasn't changed. It's the same meal. Fish and bread. Peter, you failed me. You did what you said you would never do. You have failed me. But look, I haven't changed. And I'm still for you. And I still give you the same thing that I gave you before you failed me. Come sit down and have breakfast with me, Peter. Let's talk. This is why that's so good. Because some of you don't actually think that Jesus is that good. That he will meet you in the place where you have failed. And he will offer you himself. That he goes and he dies for failures. The good news of the gospel is not that you have to clean yourself up and make yourself right to come to God. The good news of the gospel is that he chases after people who aren't right. And he gives them grace. That's the good news. And so, he restores Peter. He restores Peter sitting next to the very place where Peter has most failed him. Where have you most failed Jesus? Or, if you're not a Christian, where have you most messed up? Did you know that Jesus will meet you there and he will not shame you? He doesn't bring shame to your porn addiction. He doesn't bring shame to the way that you hate your body. He doesn't bring shame to the way that you've ruined that person's reputation. He doesn't bring shame to the way that you messed up with your boyfriend. He doesn't bring shame. He brings grace. It's true. Because he did it with Peter. He did it with Peter. The writers of the Bible did this so that you would know that it's true for you too. They, they let the disciples look like idiots so you guys would know that it's okay to be a screw-up. That God will still love and, and chase after people who mess up. And so Jesus begins restoring Peter. And when I first read this, I was like, is <laughs> Mr., uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, when, they, when I would go back and spend the night at, um, at Jack's house, after we had like almost burned their house down, um, before they would go out again, Miss Smith would bring us into the living room. She'd say, "Boys, I want y'all to come see something." We'd like walk, you know, <laughs> walk in, and this beautiful Oriental rug that she had bought for the living room, she would take it and thup, 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 roll it back, and like those black pock marks from the charcoal were still there in the ground. And she would say, boys, I don't want to come back for something like this. You understand? Like, oh, okay. And then just doop, 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 you know, roll it back and leave. And I think that that's how we think God is with our sin sometimes. You know, like he'll, Jesus covers it up, but every once in a while, God's going to like just roll that back and show it to you and shame you with it. But what Psalm 103 says is that God removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. 
It's that far removed. That's what his grace is like. So what is Jesus doing here with Peter then? Is he rolling back the carpet? Because did you, did you notice that he asks Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Now, Peter has denied Jesus three times. Jesus, and he's denied him by a charcoal fire, and now they're sitting by a charcoal fire, and he's asking Jesus three times, do you love me? Or he's asking Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? But y'all, he's, he's not shaming Peter. What he's doing is he's restoring him. It's actually very tender and pastoral. Because he knows that for Peter to be healed, his sin has to be brought to light. Jesus doesn't just like roll up on the guy. He's like, you know what, Peter? I know that you totally denied me. Like, whatever. Let's just have breakfast and like forget about the whole thing ever happened. That's not how like healthy, good relationships work. Because in order for something to be healed, it has to be brought to light. This is the same as like, look, as soon as one of my kids, we have my wife, Christy, and I have four kids. As soon as one of my kids like falls and scrapes their knee on the pavement, like a hostage negotiation begins between me and them and like trying to let them wash out their knee. Because they see me coming with like the alcohol swabs and their like knee is bleeding and it's got dirt in it and they're just like, no! You know, they know what's coming because I'm about to get all up in there with this alcohol swab. And they are freaking out because they don't want that because it hurts. But if I were to leave it and be like, you know what, it's fine, whatever. All that that's going to do is it's going to lead to infection and sin is the exact same way. Jesus is doing this not because he wants to shame Peter, but because he wants, he wants to heal him. But to be healed, it hurts sometimes to bring our sin to light. What, what Jesus is doing is he's showing Peter how to repent. Look, I, I want to change something in like the Christian lexicon. May I make a suggestion for a change in the Christian lexicon? You know what lexicon, like just the way we talk. Like, Christians like to throw around the term, like, you need to recommit yourself to God. You need to be recommitted to him. You may even have a date when you recommitted yourself to God. And that's okay. That's fine. That's, I'm not, I don't want to, like, shame you for that. I'm not, I'm not here to do that. But what that assumes is this. Recommitting, your, recommitting to God assumes that the basis of your relationship is centered on your commitment to him. But that's not the basis of Jesus' relationship with Peter. It's based, it's not based on Peter's commitment to Jesus, because Peter's commitment to Jesus has sucked. The basis of their relationship is Jesus' commitment to him. And if you're a Christian, that's the basis of your relationship with Christ. It's not your commitment to him, it's his commitment to you. And so let's replace the word recommit with repent. And this is what repenting is. I, for the longest time, I thought that repenting was, here's this bad thing that I'm doing, and I'm going to turn from the bad thing that I'm doing, and I'm going to turn towards obedience. That is not repentance. It's only the first half. Repentance is, I'm going to turn from the bad thing that I'm doing. Yes. That's the beginning of repentance. And I'm going to turn to Jesus. That's true repentance. Because when we turn from our disobedience to obedience, all you're going to do is fail again, and the whole shame cycle begins again. That will probably lead to like your failure in the first place. But when you turn from your disobedience, and you turn to Jesus, who is the kind of person who could breakfast on the place of your greatest failure, there you will find free, full, unconditional grace. That's eternal. That is for you. Because he's good. That's repentance. And so... Jesus restores Peter, and then finally, he calls Peter. He calls Peter to participate in his work. And he, look, God, God works 
for the good of broken sinners. God is at work in your life, but he's at work in your life, not just so that you can be forgiven, but also so that you can participate in him bringing restoration to the people around you. That's why the way that Jesus responds every time that he asks Peter, do you love me? He says, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend my lambs. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Because look, loving God is fused at the spine with loving others. That's the conclusion that Jesus makes. If you, when you love me, you will feed my sheep. If you love God, you will love God's image bearers. Whether or not they're good people, you will feed them and love them and serve them. And what feeding them looks like is this. I love this quote. It's from D.T. Niles. He's an old missionary from back in the 1800s. He used to say this, Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. Christianity is not... You, my, my pastor used to say, our problem is we want to be bakers rather than beggars. Like, we want to make people a loaf of our own, like, righteous bread and be like, hmm, check out how awesome I am. You should be more like me. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church all the time, and I'm involved in, like, seven ministries on campus. You should be like me. That is going to lead to despair. That is not feeding the sheep. Feeding yourself, Peter. Feeding the sheep. That's like bringing someone showing them your need, that you're a beggar, that Jesus fed by grace, and that, you know what, if he fed me, he'll feed you too. Because I'm a beggar. I didn't do anything to deserve this. Some of y'all feel like really overwhelmed and guilty for not like evangelizing to your friends and having all the right answers. Your friends don't need all the right answers, they need your weakness. That's what your friends need from you. They don't need you to crush it at like Bible exposition and shooting down all of their like arguments. What they need is your weakness. What they need to see if you're a Christian is that God actually came to you in your brokenness and that he'll do that for them too. So if you sit down to like tell someone about Jesus, don't just start like barking like um, some like playlist of things that they need to know. Like tell them about your brokenness. That's how you that's how you tell other beggars where you found bread. But look, this is risky. Loving other people is risky. Did you see that Jesus said? to Peter, like, it's going to lead to your death, Peter. That's what he said at the end, that he prophesies how Peter's going to die. Um, so, y'all aren't going to believe this story is true. I heard it on a podcast. It's probably true. So, Invisibilia, any Invisibilia fans out there? Y'all haven't listened yet? Oh, it's so good. All right, anyway, um, all these, like, really cool, interesting stories. So, this man, Michael Raptos, had, uh, he's a, uh, a chef in Washington, D.C. He had just opened up a new restaurant. He's super excited, and he had a big celebration with all of his friends and family, and he laid out, uh, like, this beautiful table in his backyard in, um, in D.C. He was just not, like, you know, like the, it was, like, kind of looked like the, like, the magazine covers with, like, the festoon lights and, like, the candles lit and, like, some kind of, like, vase that looked beautiful and flowers not based it's boss if you want to be like I don't know, on a cool magazine anyway um so like he has this whole thing laid out and they're having this beautiful meal with all of his friends and family and they're celebrating they're toasting the new um restaurant that he's opened and then all of a sudden the whole party comes to a screeching halt because a man has appeared in their backyard and he has a gun to michael rapto's wife's head and he says give me all your money and like, this is like the 21st century. Nobody had any cash on them. And so they're in this like standoff of like what to do. And the, the people, Michael is telling his story. He's like, some people were crying. Some people were afraid. 
some people like began to try to like convince this guy like not to do this like some like what would your mother think if you were doing this like why would you come and do this like we but then something happened that changed the whole rest of the night michael's wife christina reaches and grabs a glass of wine and turns to the man who has the gun at her head and says would you like a glass of wine and he takes the glass and he sits down at the table with the gun out still and he swirls around that like really good cabernet that like a chef would have at his dinner he smells it and he drinks from it and he begins to grab some of the, this like delicious cheese to set out and be accoutrement you know and he begins to imbibe in that and then he begins to like tell them a little bit about his life and he puts the gun down and he drinks some more wine and everyone's just kind of silent and listening this guy he was like holding them up and now he's like their dinner party guest <laughs> and he picks up his gun after he finishes that cab and cabernet whatever he uh finishes that glass and he says, I think I'm at the wrong party. And everyone's just like, okay, what does that mean? And he goes, can I have a hug? And they're like, okay, like better than getting shot, I guess. <laughs> and so they hug the guy who was just holding them at gunpoint. Did you know that that's what Jesus did for you? That when you were his enemy, when you were his enemy, that he held out grace to you. And it's his grace that makes you his friend. It's his moving towards you in grace that changes you. And so what he calls you to do, I really, I want you to think about who were your enemies. If you're a Christian here tonight, Jesus tells you that you're supposed to pray for your enemies to love those who persecute you and to pray for them because that's what he does for failures like you and me what would it look like to die to yourself it might look like when you go to Texas OU weekend that like your life looks a little bit different than everyone else around you that would feel like dying to yourself it might look like reaching out to the awkward person in your fraternity because it might hurt your reputation. That might feel like dying to yourself. It might look like being patient with your really annoying roommate. Sorry if you're like sitting by your roommate right now and it just made it awkward. But anyway, it might look like being patient with them because you're dying to yourself. Do you know why you can do that? I'll close with this. The reason you can do that, it's the same reason Peter could do it. Y'all, Peter went from being this scared dude who didn't, he was scared of a servant girl sitting by a charcoal fire. A few months later, he stands up in the book of Acts 2, 22 through 24, and he addresses the men who crucified Jesus. He talks to them. He says this, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Peter shares the gospel with the people who killed Jesus, and he's not afraid. How can someone go from being a scared coward to standing up to the people who crucified Jesus? There's only one way. Peter knew that it was true, that Jesus rose from the dead. That's the only way he could go from being a runaway coward to standing and proclaiming the gospel is that it's true. Jesus rose from the dead and the gospel is true. He died for failures. He defeated death. And so what he calls you to do is what he calls Peter to do at the very end. The last words he says to Peter follow me. So follow him. Just believe. 
repent and believe. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom um, in what it might look to follow you. And Lord Jesus, we ask um, that you would do that by your grace. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.